church what a joy it is to have you in this online church experience even as we get into a time of worship can i just encourage you to really lean into the god of the universe he is here he is with you right wherever you are at you could be at home you could be on the road wherever you are at i believe that god is with you he is for you and he is here waiting uh, to engage with us to communicate with us so as we are into time of worship can i just encourage you um to really um bring your senses all of them to him and say lord i'm here for you what would you have for me what do you want to speak to me if you can come in with that hunger and thirst i believe god is going to meet you let's worship god together we are blessed and we are thankful that we get to do this and with, without wasting any more time let's worship him let's sing song he is our rock and let's worship him at this time There is no rock there is no god like our god No other name worthy of all our praise If you want to clap and sing again The rock of salvation that cannot be moved is proven itself to be faithful and true There is no rock there is no god like our There's no rock There is no rock There is no god like our god No other name No other name worthy of all our praise The rock of salvation that cannot be moved is proving himself to be faithful and true There is no rock There is no god like our it is for us to worship this god and if i can ask you what do we have that we can bring before him and if we look into the first brothers cain and abel from the bible we read god accepted one offering and when abel brought the best of the best the first of his labor God blessed his offering what is that we offer before him because a lot of the times we are so much we just want to stay away from certain things because we feel very convicted in our spirit and and we so want to stay away from it because we can't change few things but today how far we have been can we come back to him with whatever we have God looks at our heart 
let's come to him and offer the best praise that he alone deserves with our very lips we have said so many things but even at this time even as we sing the song can we come to that place and offer him all that we have even if it has been so many days so many months so many years that you have singed your that you have sung your heart out but can you take this time i believe i'm talking to someone here can you take this time to offer everything that you have he sees a heart jesus You seem so far away a million miles or more it feels today do i have lost my faith i must confess right now but it's hard for me to pray say i don't know where to start he gives us grace as you give the grace with all it's in my heart i will say sad for me to see all the thoughts and plans you have for me but i will put my trust in you knowing that you died to set me free i'm coming back lord I don't know what to say I don't know where to start But as you give the grace with all it's in my heart I will say closer Lord Jesus Hallelujah Hallelujah 
I long for you, Lord. Fill us. Fill us even at this time, Lord Jesus. May us on earth, Lord Father, sing the songs of heaven. Jesus. 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 How I long to breathe the air of heaven, but pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me. I walk with Death will be no more Standing face to face But he who died and rose again Holy, holy is the Lord Jesus Now we pray Great in desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we we'll see that it was worth it. He returns to wipe away our tears.
Father, we just thank you and we praise you. We thank you for you are the God of the universe. We thank you that you are the God of heaven and earth. We thank you, Lord, that you are the creator. You're the sustainer. You're the giver of new life. Father, we thank you that you are sovereign over everything around us. And so we praise your holy name. We bless your holy name. We pray that, Lord, as we head into this new week, that you would go before us. Father, I pray that you will breathe life into the things that we touch. We pray that, God, when we are still praying to you, that, Lord, you will begin to answer things. Father, I pray that our hearts will be in tune with you. Help us to abide in your love. Help us, Lord, to experience you in all of your goodness. In all of your glory. Father, we just right now pray for anyone who is aching or hurting right now. If there is grief in their life, if it feels like a crushing weight, that Father, you will come in and you would comfort them. You would lift the burden. You would strengthen them in this time. Father, I pray for those who are sick. We pray in Jesus' name for healing in their bodies. We pray that spirit, soul, and body will be restored in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that you will continue to surround them with your peace and your presence. Father, I pray very specially for those who are living in war-torn lands. We pray for the lands of Ukraine and Russia. We pray, Lord, for the, the lands of Israel and Gaza. We just bless every person there, Lord, as they attempt to rebuild, as they attempt, Lord, and wait for peace. We just believe that, God, you are their peace. Jehovah Shalom, I pray that you would make your presence known there, that you would strengthen them, you would fill them with your spirit, oh God. I just pray, God, that you would touch these lands and restore these lands. I pray, God, that you will work in the hearts of leaders and turn these leaders towards you so that justice and righteousness will flow through countries, Father God. We bless our nation at this time. Even as we go through this time of elections, we pray for peace across the land. We pray for unity. We pray for oneness of heart and mind. We pray that, Lord, the leaders you have ordained would come into power, Father. We pray that these leaders will do good for all the people of the land, irrespective of any kind of barrier, Father. We pray for communal peace. We pray, O oh God, for policies that are set up that will benefit every human, Lord. We pray for the poor and destitute, that, Lord, your eye would be on them, that leaders would, Lord, fulfill promises made to them, O oh Father. We love you. We thank you. We know that you are doing things that we cannot even fathom and understand. And so we thank you, Lord, that your ways are higher, your thoughts are higher. We honor you. We glorify you. We exalt you. Be glorified in this place as we hear your word. We pray that you will soften our hearts. Open our ears and eyes so that we will hear you. We will experience you in a new way, O oh Father. Help us and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, if you have been um, aware, we have a lot of things happening in church life. Every Tuesday, we women meet for a time of prayer at the church space. So if you're someone who lives close to the church, we would love for you to connect with us. Tuesday mornings, women gather. Wednesday evenings, the men gather on Zoom for a time of Bible study and fellowship. So if you're available for that, you're most welcome to join and get in touch with us for the link. The women, of course, of the church meet for sisterhood every Thursday. We also meet once a month in person. We just have a time of potluck and fellowship together. So if you're a woman, you're saying, I'm looking for fellowship, this would be a great time for you to join in. We have our VBS happening from April 29th to May 3rd. So if you have a little one anywhere between the ages of 5 to 12, please register for them. Get in touch with us for the link. You can um, fill that up, give it to us, and we'll follow up with you. I just want to invite you to lean in and listen to God's word right now. We have an amazing message today uh, by Pastor Geshom. And I just pray that as we receive it, that we will be so mindful that God is speaking to each one of us personally, that we won't shrug it off, that it's for the larger body, but we will take it very personally and allow it uh, to sit with us and impact us. So let's listen to God's word together. Hi, church. Such a joy and a privilege to be bringing God's word to you today. Even as we uh, step in into... Uh, hearing what God has to say from His Word. I believe God uh, is doing in and something through us, even as we've just uh, coming after uh, a couple of weeks after the Easter Sunday. Uh, two weeks back, we heard Tina speak specifically on how God deals uh, with us in this new season that He's taking us into spring uh, rain, which means there are some old roots and attachments that we have, which we need to let go even as we step into this new season. And uh, even as I was meditating, God uh, took me to the book of Ezra. 
And uh, as uh, many of you know that we are already in the season of election in the next uh, entire month, uh, a little more than a month and a half. And as we're going through that, uh, I was just reading through uh, the book of Ezra, Zechariah um, and Haggai and all that. And I was just seeing that uh, the way in which people entered into this land of exile that God was leading them into. And uh, it was purely because of their disobedience. And we see that uh, God was still God. And even as they were under different rulers over a period of time. And even today, as we uh, take some time to meditate on God's word, the title that I've given my sermon today is Exiled Citizens. We are citizens uh, of heaven. We are citizens of uh, the true king. Uh, even as we celebrate Easter, there's only one uh, kingdom that's everlasting. And we are citizens of that because we've accepted Jesus into our hearts. But we are, in a sense, uh, living in exile because we are here in this temporary world, uh, different countries, different citizenships and all that. But we are under some form of exile here. We are living uh, in this world and we are not of this world. And so with that frame of thought, I just wanted to take some time for us to meditate and see what God has to tell us. We see from the book of Ezra that the people were um, in exile and the king of Persia uh, occupies Babylon. We see as a people who are there in exile, God has a deep uh, calling over their life. That remnant few, he wants them to go back and build the temple. And God moves the heart of the king. And it was a reminder that even as we especially are in this um, life, temporary life here on this earth, when we are in exile, it's God who moves the hearts of people around us. It's not us. It's not our doing. It's God in his uh, might can move the hearts of people who don't know his name, who are uh, against us for some reason who are against uh, us probably because of uh, the information that they have been surrounded by, what they have listened growing up. And this is where we see God having a distinct assignment for the remnant. He uses the mouth of the king to in fact decree what he wants his people to do. But even before that, even when Jeremiah was actually telling the people that they had to go uh, into exile, there was an assignment that God gave even in their fallen state, even as he knew that they had kept disobeying him, they did detestable things, they didn't honor him, they um, desecrated his temple. And even before they went into exile, this is what Jeremiah tells all those who are heading in. And some of the verses that we are reading in this, we already probably know, we've claimed it here and there. But I believe when we read it in its entirety context, God is giving us a mandate even when we are in exile. Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 4 to 14 says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. In verse 10, this is what it says. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. You will seek me with all your heart. I will be found, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And this got me thinking many a times today uh, in 2024, when things don't go our way, we immediately go into this mode of not doing anything. We immediately go into this mode of, you know what, shutting the doors and just saying, you know, I want to be all by myself. Yes, God, and uh, the fallen state of our nature is always to, you know, close up. And in fact, we see that in the Garden of Eden, when um, God actually uh, dealt with Adam and Eve, he sent them out of the garden. 
he you know gave them clothing because he had they had to cover their shame but even as they went out he said you know what uh, he sent them out and they figured out they had to live out the curse that was on them their man had to till uh, the land to bring um, vegetation and other things eve had to undergo childbirth uh, pains of childbirth and so as we see all that there is pain associated with exile there is a sense of suffering uh, uh, associated with exile there is a sense of losing freedom you're not in your own land you you have that uh, as one uh, which you're trying to figure out god why is this happening to us do we deserve this but god's also gracious and so today in our exile what is god wanting us to do as we read in jeremiah he said build homes settle down plant gardens eat find wives increase in number seek the peace and prosperity of the land pray to the lord there are these instructions that are given so that we will look to him in our exile and not to others around and so today in our exile are we looking around to find out what the future holds or are we looking around to know what what's going to happen in the next couple of months are we looking to because of many because today if we are not careful our surroundings will control even when we are here on this temporary assignment on this earth when we are in exile and god saying i want to come back to a place in fact with israel going into exile 70 years later when he's bringing them back there was a physical place where god wanted to meet with them god wanted them to come to a place so that later when they come that they're not coming um, you know in smaller numbers they're not coming disheveled they're not coming but they're coming as a prosperous nation back so that through the people remnant who came back he will be able to come into this earth so that we'll be able to experience jesus here on this earth god has a divine plan there is a plan for him to redeem us there was a plan when he had kept us in uh when we had sinned and when we had moved out of the garden of eden even at this time when he's sending them into exile he's sending them there but he's saying pray to me but also keep doing what you're called to do there so today even as we are entering into this um you know phase of elections and all that as we don't know what the outcome is may our eyes be on jesus may our eyes be on jesus may our eyes be to the god who has created the heaven and earth may we pray to him because he wants us to still keep doing what he's called us to do and I, even as i meditated on this i realized there are two key things in which god uh, takes the background and our doing becomes the forefront of all of this especially when we are in exile even as when we were reading um, you know the stories of uh, israel leaving egypt and coming we see as we are reading in exodus the the turmoil in which they were uh, being uh, tasked the the heavy yoke that was on them but it's interesting that when they come out into freedom even as they're walking through the wilderness to the promised land they always recount the food they ate they recount uh, the the way they lived their lives there they recount having a permanent roof over their head god saying and reminding us do you want to live in freedom where you will experience um, uh, the the fruit of the land or do you want to live in the freedom where you are, know that your sins are forgiven that you belong to the king of kings and here is temporary so god what is my assignment here on this earth because god wants today to set us apart we are citizens of heaven we are not citizens of this earth we belong to a country we all have a nationality we all have a country of origin but our eternal purpose is that we are citizens of heaven if we have accepted jesus christ as a lord and personal savior and so when we are in exile here our eyes have to be looking different and we see here the first thing that god draws our heart is to his altar when god we are exiled to god's altar we are not exiled to uh, the prosperity of the land we are exiled to god's altar ezra chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 in the first year of cyprus king of persia in order to fulfill the word of the lord spoken by jeremiah the lord moved the heart of cyprus king of persia to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing this is what cyrus the king of persia says the lord the god of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at jerusalem in judah any of his people 
among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of the Lord. So even as we read this, we see that God moves the heart of the king for his purpose. God moves the heart of the king. God gives favor. And so today we as people who are being exiled, you know, we are in living in exile, we will have that same favor if we seek God. If we seek God. In Jeremiah, as I read over that, it says, pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I believe when we start praying for the lands that we are part of, for the uh, cities and the states that we are part of, we will have that undue favor that we do not even need to have because God is working in our midst. Those permissions would come. Those things that need to be accomplished for his purpose will come. God will make it to pass. But will you and I come to a place of saying, God, let your will be done and let not my will be done. Because when God moves certain things, nothing can be shaken. All that glory will go back to him. In Ezra chapter 3, we read this. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals took their places, praised the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout to the praise of the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many other older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. What we read here happen is the fact that the foundation stone is being laid. We see that Joshua, who's at that point the high priest, Zerubbabel, who's coming in to govern the entire thing, start laying it and then they start singing praise. And even as I mentioned, we are exiled to God's altar. The importance is the fact that the altar has to be the central theme. When God brought them back, the first command he made was to build their altar. And today the first command that we as his followers have is to build his altar in our own lives. Today as Jesus walked on this earth, he said in three days, this I will destroy this temple and the temple will be resurrected. He was talking about himself. And today we are his temple as we've accepted him into our hearts. He resides in us. So if God brought the remnant out to build the altar first and gave them the command specifically to build the altar, it's because... He wanted them to have a place of worship. That place of worship is where we meet with God. In the time that they were living in, they had to offer sacrifices. There was only one group of people who could do that, the Levites. And we see today as the redeemed, we all have access to God directly. The veil is torn. And so even as a veil is torn, are we having an altar where we take everything to God? Many a times the altar that we've built today in 2024 is we've removed all the sanctity around the altar and we've made it so casual that we fail to approach God solely concentrating and saying, God, you alone is what we need. There are so many distractions. Today, if I have to ask you, what are those times when you actually call on to God, are they intentional or are they ones where you just or say, God, just come through and you just leave it and go, are you pursuing? Because God wants to meet with you at that altar place. God wanted Israel to come back to their first love. God is asking us to come back to that place of altar. Yes, we are in exile. Yes, we have someone else over, uh, you know, governing us, but our eyes are on the king. And he says, the more you cherish me at this altar, the more I'll be able to speak to you. And one of the drawbacks about going back to the altars, we can always go back to the old framework. We see that there were many who were actually living beyond, um, you know, uh, way before when they saw the old temple. And they are probably weeping and saying that was the former glory. But God's telling here, no, what 
is happening now is what is important. You are coming back. Redemption is happening now. We live in our moment today. We are worshipping our God now. No longer can we take refuge in the saying, you know what, back in 10 years back, I was worshipping God with all my heart. No, what is God doing right now? Are you able to worship God even in the midst of all the hardships you're going through in the midst of your loneliness, in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of the despair, in the midst of the grief, are you able to are you able to worship God? Because if your reference point is going back, you will never be able to see God for what He is now. We need to worship God for who He is now, because then we'll be able to move into the season that God has. If God wants us to be creating these spaces where we will be able to have our altar. That's why it's so important. How do we engage? How do we worship God? Today we worship God by reading His Word because His Word helps us to see God and we start glorifying Him. We see Him in different um, different buckets. We see Him as a Redeemer, as a King, as a Father, as a Shepherd, as uh, our true companion. We see the Holy Spirit who opens up a whole different uh, arena of uh, the different attributes of God for us to hold on to. But are we going to the altar? Because that's what God wants us to do. If you read in Ezra chapter 3, we see the people around these uh, the newly people who had come in from the remnant who had come in to build started exercising, uh, you know, and pushing them around and, you know, bullying them and, you know, trying to get them to intimidate them. And it says in uh, Ezra chapter 3, verse, despite their fear of the people around them, they built an altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening. They just built an altar at that point. But they wanted to give God the glory and today it's in our altar where we allow fear to go far away it's in that altar where we dispel every dart the enemy is trying to do yes people around will look at us people around will mock us people around will be like ridiculing us but lord i'll go back to the altar I'll go back to the altar because that's where I need, I see you. That's where I find you. That's where I know that you are with me. Today, are we crippled by the fear of people being around? Are we unwilling to do and obey because of the fear that's surrounding us? That's why we need Jesus today in our lives. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm sending you a helper. The helper is with us. So today, wherever it is, if it is in your office where you struggle, build an altar there. Build an altar there. Altar is where you are at this moment. You can build it right there. Take it into the areas where you need Him the most. Don't leave Him outside and try fighting these battles alone. Take Him in. Build an altar. Throw everything that is not of Him right there. So today, as our response to building that altar is one of unadulterated worship. You know, we just saw the news, uh, Nestle uh, apparently is mixing uh, so many grams of sugar with their cell lac and everything. And um, that's why a lot of kids are eating it. And we see it is God's asking for an unadulterated worship. What is the song that's God asking you to sing? What is your posture of worship? That's why I, I, I struggle um, when I see people who don't have, when they look at worship as something they have to put up with. No, worship is, God, you, I'm not even worthy to be here. They want worship to be comfortable. So they, they even struggle to stand up. They struggle to lift their hands. They struggle to, you know, showcase, God, this is what you mean to me. We've come to what is unadulterated worship is, I don't worship only when I like the song. I worship because I'm worshipping the King. And God saying, would you worship me at the altar? Don't worship everything else that makes the altar. Worship me. And for a long time, in the I think more than a year, this imagery has always been there of worship for me, where I go to the altar I lay everything there. I say, Lord, whatever I'm having today here on this earth is because of you. If I get to have a wife, if I get to have my kids, if I get to have things that I value the most, 
I lay all that at the altar because all these take my affections. I lay it at the altar, but my eyes may it be lifted to you and may it not be on the altar. May I not be concerned about all that I lay there, Lord. And God is wanting that kind of a worship from him. As exiles, can we worship him like that? So that we will be able to say, Lord, irrespective of what's happening around, you are still seated on the throne. You are still Lord and King. Fear will not be anywhere close. Fear will not be anywhere close. We see that in this season, as the people around, they bribed, they made sure that they didn't work, they made sure that they didn't, uh, they were not able to work, they made sure they wrote a letter which states that these are the people who will revolt against you, so don't give them the permission to do this. We see time and again, um, all these things rise up to a point where the king says, you know what, let's, uh, let's stop. And for the next 16 years, they stopped building the temple. And I believe when opposition comes, we still need to look to God. We still need to look to God. We need to have a posture. And we see in the next point when I'm going into that somewhere in this opposition, they took a, they took a step back. They said, God, uh, they, didn't, they didn't seek God because if they had sought God, God would have given them clarity. God would have given them breakthrough. But God raises another person called Haggai to speak. And the second thing that we see is when we are exiled, God wants us to be committed to his body. And what does that look like? We see that when the, when the existing remnant who went failed to do what God had called them to do, he raises up Haggai. And Haggai says this in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheathil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zodak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house, Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but not but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And as we read this, we see that somewhere when opposition came, they stopped praying. When opposition rose, when those letters went out, they stopped seeking God. And God had to raise up another prophet, Haggai, to go back and instruct them. And we see here, it's obvious, because Haggai is talking from a place of seeing where they are at in the next 16 years, that they have built houses, they have settled themselves, yet the house of the Lord lies in ruins. And why did God care much at that time for the temple to be built? Because he wanted his people to worship him with all that they had. And so today you and I are in the same position where God wants us to go back. Go back so that we'll be able to worship him not in silos. Worship him not in, you know, oh, I know Jesus, I, I'll just keep it with me. No, he wants us to worship him in community. He wanted, God wanted to gather the people around. Otherwise, he would have been content with the altar. No, God starts with the altar and he moves us to forming a community so that we will be able to live in unity. In spite of our differences, we come together. Today, if you have to look at the church, as we gather here, we are in different shape, different sizes, different language, different color, different backgrounds, different, um, um, different in India, if you had say, different caste. But at the end of the day, we all come together under one single denominator followers of Jesus. And I believe in today's sermon, if I have to put it, let's say citizens of heaven, because we've acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord. And so today, why is this important? Why is God calling us to come together? In exile, in that time, God raised up an Haggai to say, bring them so that they'll be able to do this together. So that they'll be able to read scriptures together. So that they'll be able to meditate. They'll be able to grow. They'll be able to fulfill what God has in store. If God is about building today in 2024, if each of us are, he's raising up to build different altars, if he's calling us to set up our own altars, he is calling us to build it 
to have that intimacy with him. But when we come together, we are building his kingdom. Because in the grand scheme of things, we are a larger body. And God wants us to move together. We will miss out on what God's doing globally if we are sitting alone. We will miss out on what God's doing globally if we are just confined and not keeping our eyes open. God wanted the people of Israel to experience the glory that comes down when they all gather and worship. And at that time when they worshipped was a messy affair, sacrifice, uh, the trumpets blowing together, they all lifted. It says that even as they were wailing and crying and worshipping, at a distance it just heard as noise. They couldn't. And that's the beauty about worship when we gather as community. For some, it's a joyful time. For some, it's a time of crying. For some, it's a time of reconciliation. For some, it's a time of forgiveness. But at the end of it, that's what worship looks to God. It's not one unison of everything. It is worshipping God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And it sounds, it might sound like noise to us, but to God it's worship. That's what I've come to understand. It might sound like noise to us, but it is worship. And so today, if you and I are having, are unable to build our own altars individually, we will never respond. We will never succeed in responding to the true call of what God is calling us to build together. Because it's in these places of intimacy with him that he reveals why we need a corporate body. Today I came, I mean, um, uh, one of our church members who was with us before and now has moved to another city, used to use this word called, I'm a corporate slave. You know, he used to use this word. And even as I was writing down my sermon, I just realized the word corporate exile. Today, what is, uh, if, if you have to just find out what that meaning was, it's usually used to describe employees who work beyond their job description, who sometimes uh, are uh, under punishing conditions. And today, if we are not careful, the world will put us under exile. We the call and mandate for us as a Christian is that we have eternity secure, but we are here temporary. Which means that um, everything that we do here, we do it faithfully, really well, so that we are ready for eternity. When we look in a worldly way, we'll see that there are so many ways in which we f might feel like exiles, which, which are of our own doing. We uh, probably our debt situation, probably our relationship issues, probably the way things have happened around us. A lot of it could be the consequences of us. And God saying, can you invite me even into that because I can change that right here. You don't have to come to heaven to experience that, but I can bring down heaven here on earth. And today a lot of us are struggling in that same space to say, God, I'm struggling to give you control. But he's saying, allow me to bring, allow me to enter in, allow me to enter into everything. If you're in debt, I'll teach you contentment so that you'll be able to overcome debt. If you're struggling in your relationship, I'll teach you how to hold on to me and how to forgive and, you know, be discerning so that you'll be able to sustain relationships. If you're unable to, you know, be successful in who you are, I'll give you the strength so that you'll be an overcomer. You'll exercise self-control. So as we compare our lives, God's calling us to be a Christian exile so that we will be dependent on his lordship. We'll be dependent on Him. We'll go to Him alone and no one else. We will seek Him alone and no one else. And so as much as we are striving here on this earth to make sure ends are met, to make sure things are happening, we should also realize that the God that we worship has to be invited into everything that we do because He reigns over everything. He controls everything. Paul writes this to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 to 21. Brothers and sisters, together follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you. For there are many of them who I often told you and now tell you even with tears who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity, and whose glory is in their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by exerting that power which enables him even to subject everything to himself, will not only transform but completely refashion our earthly bodies so that they will be like his glorious resurrected bodies.
So today, even as we saw, we are exiled to God's altar. We are also exiled to God's body. You can't uh, discount any of these two. The two, the, the couple of things that we see from the Philippian passage that we read is we need to identify what are some of the things that will cause us to move away from this. The first thing is we see is we will be, if you're not careful, we can subtly become enemies of the cross. What is that? We will suddenly say, God, this Christian life is too much. I want to just ditch it right now and just be left alone. So that's why we suddenly have a lot of skeptics. We have people who are like, you know what? This Christian faith doesn't make sense. Suddenly you have these questions. Oh, we worship this God. So only, um, uh, so only bad is happening. God is sovereign. God doesn't owe us any explanation whether good or bad has to happen. God didn't promise us that he's created a world where there'll be no war. He created mankind who eventually end up having war. He created mankind who ended up bringing sickness into this world. He ended up creating mankind who became the problem. So it starts with us. And so he's saying, be careful of those who will be enemies of the cross because they will say, you know what, a good God won't want, uh, won't do bad things. And that's very, it's a very narrow understanding because we think a good father will only mean good, but a good father also corrects, a good father also disciplines, a good father also allows his child to find his way. With, even if it means his son has to go through an hardship and come out. So today, May we be people who realize that this person who's talking to me is an enemy of the cross. I need to pray for them, but I won't allow that to influence me. The second we see is the, the things that will distract us, the things that will distract us from the altar and from his body are, uh, it says here, the God is their belly. You know, today, if you look, uh, with the amount of eateries that are happened, even with the rise of Swiggy and Zomato and food coming to our doorstep, we are so caught up in, uh, you know, in making sure our bellies are filled, in making sure our appetites are filled, in making sure our food is presented such a way, making sure the ambience of a place matters to me so much, so much that it's become an idolatry. It's so much that it's become an idol in itself. So much that we make sure that we are meticulous about planning and spending time and being there and doing all that. And even as I say this point about our, the food being more like a god, like an idol, is because today we have given so much time, effort. Our, we are only worried about that. We are so bent on pleasing ourselves about that. That has become the centrality. We, in fact, discount people who we don't want to eat with because the, of the fact that they don't appreciate this kind of food. But if food is going to be a tool for us to start conversations, to build relationships, to make sure our conversations go down deeper, the waterline goes deeper, we will soon realize that we want meaningful things in life. It says here specifically that their worldly appetite which is regard to food and everything. It could be from real estate to cars to everything materialistically to their sensuality to basically the way they uh, want to enjoy personal things for themselves, their bodily pleasure, their vanity, the way they look. Today, if we are not careful, we'll be so caught up with that that we'll miss out on building our altar. We'll miss out on being and participating as his body. And it goes on to say the third thing is whose glory is their shame. Today the world is degrading itself in so many ways. Values are been brought to a place where the values are so shameful and they're taking glory in that. And so church, if we need to be impactful today, if we need to be impactful for God here on this earth, we need to hold on to him. We need to ask him to work in and through us. The call is not for us to have dual citizenship. As much as the world talks about, you know, you can migrate and have dual citizenship. No, we are of one citizen. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We do not take the easy street. We do not, we cannot be haters of the cross. We cannot be ones who idolize things that man is creating, things that man is projecting, saying this will, this is something you need to enjoy. Things that we think are 
were once of value, now are shame and we are glorifying that. Today God wants us so that we'll be able to walk in the promise that God has. And what is this promise? In Haggai chapter 2 verses 4 to 9, this is what it says in the message. It says, so get to work Zerubbabel, God is speaking. Go, get to work, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, high priest. Get to work, all you people, God is speaking. Yes, get to work, for I am with you. The God of the angel armies is speaking. Put into action the word I covenanted with you when you left Egypt. I am living and breathing among you right now. Don't be timid, don't hold back. This is what the God of angel armies said. Before you know it, I will shake up sky and earth, ocean and fields, and I'll shake up all the godless nations. They'll bring brushels of wet, and I will fill this temple with splendor. God of angel armies says so. I own the silver, I own the gold, decree the God of angel armies. This temple is going to end up far better than when it started. A glorious beginning, but an even more glorious finish. A place in which I will hand out wholeness and holiness. Decree of the God of angel armies. Today, what is he decreeing? He's decreeing wholeness. When we come to Jesus, when we've built our altar, when we've come into community and we are, we are building his kingdom, when we've, because wherever we gather, we are representation of the kingdom, you will see a sense of wholeness. You know, somehow we think wholeness uh, cannot uh, have its marks. But the Christian wholeness is one which will have its dents, which will have its tinkering, which will have its repainting and all that to showcase that it was touched by God. I don't want wholeness which I've strived, but I want wholeness that comes from God because He's repaired areas of me. And that happens when we are closely moving to see that altar when we hold on to him closely in that altar spaces. And when he moves us to a place, we are able to say, God, I'm here to worship you for who you are amongst others. Irrespective of what the, each one is going through, we are all here to worship you. That's what it says in John 14, which I want to leave with you, verses 11 to 17. For those of you who are struggling to allow the Holy Spirit to move in and through you, I want to say Jesus is here. He walked on this earth. He needed the help of the Spirit. And so today, God the Father, God the Son and God the Spirit are willing to walk with us and work in us. Even as I read this, would you believe with me? Could you raise your hand even wherever you're at? Believe in John 14 verse 11. It says, believe me that I am the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so today I want us to be in a place where we with raised hands are saying, Holy Spirit, we want you. May we ask and do what pleases the Father, what is in the will of the Father so that we'll be able to accomplish it. And that happens when we are exiled to his altar and we are exiled to his body. It's his altar and his body. And Lord, today, even as, we, as we've heard this word, I just want to pray a prayer of confession right now. If we've replaced anything else, Lord Jesus, in this altar, if it's been our work, if it's been our spouse, if it's been our career, if it's been our riches, if it's been our accolades, we ask for forgiveness. And we see to you, Lord Jesus. Tear down everything, Lord. Tear down everything that's of self, pride, that you would tear it down. I pray, Lord, even as we move into a space, Lord Jesus, of understanding that we are not in, alone in this journey, that we will move to a place of who all you've called. We thank you that you tore the veil. Once and for all, we have access. And we thank you we get to journey with others. I pray, Lord, in our worship, may you be exalted. In our crying, in our praise, in our joyfulness, May you be lifted up, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Be lifted up. Be lifted up, Lord. Take your rightful place. I pray that, Lord, we will always be looking forward, that we won't look back to the glory that God came through, but we will look forward, Lord. Whatever you're going to do, we will be looking forward, Lord Jesus. 
we thank you that we are exiles in your kingdom we are exiles under your lordship and we are a citizen of heaven lord be with us i pray that lord you will bless the food and water of our home strengthen us be with us i pray specifically that you will help us lord to draw closer to you to see you more clear in your most holy name we pray amen amen so church even as you step into this week i pray may you find that altar which will be a place where you'll be able to commune with god you'll be able to lean on him hold on to him and ask him for his strength and i pray specifically that even as you um move into a place of getting to know god that you'll also move closer to a community where you'll be able to find him enjoy the presence of his community you know you don't need an invitation you don't have to be told what to do you automatically will do what you what you've been created to do that's what happens when jesus is living inside you and i pray that you will be able to live out all that he's called you to do especially in what he's said in that i believe that the glory of the present house will be greater than the glory of the former house that you will experience him day after day week after week year after year have a blessed week everyone god bless you all So church can I close the service today may the love of the father the grace of his only son Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore and all God's people said amen amen So church even as you just heard um we are all exiles living here on earth but the beautiful thing is that our citizenship is in heaven and while we are here on earth the holy spirit enables us to navigate life here with greater purpose so as we enter this week I urge you Uh, to en- to enlarge your worship times to spend greater times in the presence of god and to not do it in isolation not to be in solitary confinement but to really engage with your community of faith and to grow with other believers that's where um you really experience god and all his goodness most importantly remember this that whoever finds jesus finds life god bless you <laughs>